I'm back. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I know it's been a minute since I dropped an episode, but as you can see, I've been busy, moved into a brand new studio, all kinds of crazy things going on. But I'm back in action, ready to bring you guys episodes that I know you'll enjoy. Like today's episode, for example. My guest today, Connie Nightingale, she's an amazing individual. There are so many things that she's wrapped up in, and her and I could have literally talked for hours. She's a certified nutritionist and a personal trainer. She's a former bodybuilder and a self-professed health optimization nerd. If that wasn't enough, she's a podcaster. She's got a show called the Fit Farming Food Mom Podcast. Yep, that's a mouthful. Well, we're talking about food and nutrition, so it should be a mouthful. Anyway, like I said, I could have talked to Connie for hours. This was an amazing episode, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Connie, welcome to the Jacked Up Podcast. It is awesome to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, I'm excited to have you here. You have done so many things with your life that intrigue me so much. The bodybuilding especially. We're definitely going to talk about that because that's a passion of mine as well. But um, for my for my listeners um, that may not know you or know your story, can you just kind of back up in time a little bit and tell us how you got interested in nutrition and bodybuilding and all that stuff throughout your own journey? Oh boy. So do you want the sweet and condensed version or do you want the, 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 the long and the, the, the super long part? It can get pretty crazy, but I'll try to keep it short here. Um, so basically, um, when I was eight years old, my mom didn't let us watch TV. Um, I'm from a really religious family. And so when I was eight years old, I snuck over to the neighbor's house and we watched the terminator and that kind of good old arnie in that movie kind of like set the background for this kind of little background obsession for bodybuilding i guess so uh and when i say that i don't mean i was like pumping iron in the gym and all of that stuff i wasn't i just kind of always was super intrigued with bodybuilders and it was something i always kind of looked into or followed and mm -hmm. nobody really knew about it even because i was pretty quiet about it but um in a high school i started lifting a lot of weights i was on a weightlifting team i did a couple power lifting competitions uh which is kind of funny because I my mom just dropped off all my junk at my house the other day and I saw some of the trophies in there which was hilarious <laughs> but um anyway uh but at the time I didn't look like I was some gym rat I was just um lifting for strength and I had this ideal ideal woman in my head like what I should look like if I'm working out and doing all these things and it didn't happen and I always couldn't figure out why, you know, I mean, I had right. big, huge muscles, but I also had a lot of fat on top of it. And so, um, not until later in life did I learn why that was happening. Probably my diet had a lot to do with it. Um, but anyways, I get out of high school and I had always wanted to get back in the gym, but it just wasn't something that could happen for me at the time. I was super busy. Um, I was working. I had my son when I was 20 years old. So kids sometimes make it a little more difficult to live an ap active lifestyle. Uh, and then my husband and I, we were racing motocross full time every single weekend. I was a sponsored uh, racer. And so we put a lot of time into that and that didn't include working out at the gym. However, racing dirt bikes is a really um, full body sport. Uh, like say, when you are, yeah. when you're, yeah, you may not be working out, but you're working out. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of strength to hang on to a dirt bike and, uh, especially flying through the air and stuff like that. So anyways, we, we were training, we were on our bikes three times a week, racing Sundays. And we did that for years and years. And I had wanted to get into the gym, but it was just not something that could happen. And so that worked for my lifestyle. We would ride bicycles and we would train on our bikes and that was about it. So anyway, flash forward, um, to about five years ago now, um, my son has trouble with severe ADHD and we were trying to figure out what we could do to help him. We didn't want to put him on medications. Finally we did because they said they weren't going to help us anymore if we didn't. Um, mm. And so we put him on medications and that actually made things a lot worse for him. Um, and so I started looking into any 
modality that I could find that could help him with his ADHD. And you hear all about these different diets that they have for kids, like they remove red food dyes and gluten and all these things. And we tried all of it and we just didn't get anywhere. And so my husband and I went and sat in on this holistic seminar um, for kids with autism and ADHD and it was mind boggling. It was completely crazy. Everything that the lady was describing was what was going on with my son. And so she kind of pulled us aside after the seminar and she was like, hey, uh, I could tell that you guys have a real problem going on at home because of the, the looks on your faces when I was talking about this and you shaking your head, yes, yes, yes. And so uh, anyway, she said, I would like to invite you to my at my practice, we have uh, a couple guests every every month, and we have one that talks about food as well, and we think that that would be a great fit for you guys. So I went to that one. My husband was unable to join me, and when I came home, I was like, we're changing everything. And it, the, the diet that they were pushing was called the GAPS diet, um, which stands for Gut and Psychology Syndrome. It's a really interesting model based on your gut health because as you may or may not know, your gut is known as your second brain. And if your second brain is disrupted, which a lot of people have this disruption and they don't even know it and it's showing up in the forms of anxiety and depression and so many other things, uh, then you, you don't, you can't act properly when you have all this stuff going on. So anyways, we decided that we were going to do this GAPS diet. And within a couple of weeks, we started noting, noting a huge difference in my son, like massively huge. But it wasn't just my son that we were noticing the differences in. Um, I started noticing that I was shedding weight really fast after a lifelong struggle with my weight. Um, mm -hmm. And I also noticed that I didn't have that bloated feeling anymore. I didn't have the brain fog, the fatigue. I mean, I was so exhausted and I thought it was just a mom thing, right? You're running around, you're trying to take care of kids and you're just totally worn out. And that's what I thought it was. And come to find out it was totally food. And when I say food, it does, it's not like we were out eating fast food or anything like that. I was cooking what I thought was healthy home cooked meals, you know, like spaghetti that's healthy and, right. uh, and you know, steak and broccoli. That's great. Right. But you got to have a dinner roll. You got to have that carbohydrate there. Right. And so basically we switched our diets and within a couple of weeks my husband was like my back is not hurting anymore i don't know why it all of a sudden stopped hurting but my back is not hurting anymore and we yeah. started noticing all these subtile changes and within six weeks i had lost i don't know probably 10 or 20 pounds and everybody was asking if i was sick or something because i was shedding the weight so fast but i think that a lot of that weight was inflammation and I yeah. think that my body was hanging on to it and it was just totally angry. And I noticed that, you know, at one point I was having some health struggles and they tested me for lupus. They tested me for all these thyroid conditions and they couldn't find anything. And I think that a lot of it had to do with um, my diet. So basically to rewind a little bit, I was being tested for all these autoimmune diseases, which they didn't find. Uh, and so here in the future we found out i actually did have an autoimmune disease i had hashimoto's and pcos which was later diagnosed and it turns out that when i switched to the gaps diet it reversed a lot of that and so that's yep. why i had such great results from switching so anyway the gaps diet is very bland lots of boiled vegetables bone broths things like that it's it's um it's very, very basic, but we stuck with it. We did it for a full 16 months and I had lost like 50 pounds and I was looking at myself in the mirror. People were asking if I was okay because I lost so much weight, but I wasn't starving. I was eating lots of food. And right. I remember looking in the mirror one day and being like, oh, I've lost so much weight, but now I just look like I could see my ribs in my chest. I just yeah. looked like flat. I had no shape. And I remember like looking in the mirror and going, man, if I could start working out, then I would have some muscle tone and this would look a whole lot better. Right. But the only person that's going to be responsible for that is going to be me. <laughs> and I literally that day, I don't know what, what triggered it, but I made that decision in the mirror that 
I was going to be responsible for changing the way I looked. And if I wanted to look a certain way that nobody else was going to do it for me, no excuses were going to get me there. I needed to set my goal and make it happen. So I basically wrote on a sticky note, stuck it on my mirror, said, Hey, I'm going to start working out every day at 4 a.m. That's the only time I can do it where it won't interrupt my family time. And right. so every single day I would wake up and start working out. <laughs> so uh, my routine started out pretty basic. It was like three sets of 10 body weight squats, or three sets of push ups, mm -hmm. three sets of pull of, uh, of sit-ups, you know, just basic, basic, basic. And right. then I got a kettlebell, a 20 pound kettlebell. So then oh. I started doing body weight squats with a kettlebell and doing like kettlebell swings. And so I had like four or five things I would do every morning. And I started noticing differences pretty quickly. Uh, and then I started getting like addicted, right? Cause like, Ooh, you got a bicep sweet. That's amazing. Let's keep going. And it was very motivating to see the changes that were happening, doing some basic routine. So then I started thinking, okay, well, what, what can I do to do more? Because I want to do more, more is always better. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, I uh, ended up getting rid of everything in my office and buying a bench press with a leg extension attachment and putting it in my office and working out. And then I had to start splitting it into days. We had upper body day, <laughs> lower body day. It was pretty uh -huh. crazy because I couldn't fit it all into my between 4 and 5 a.m. hour. So right. um, things started turning into splits. And then next thing you know, the carousing the internet and looking up every single kind of workout that you can do and different training modality and all of these things. Well, lo and behold, I start to get pretty jacked and I'm like, okay, uh, I could totally compete. This would be really awesome. And mm -hmm. so then I had to tell my husband that I wanted to step on stage and he was like, Oh, uh, I don't know that you're wearing not very much. If you get on stage in one of those little sparkly <laughs> bikinis, you know, and I said, Hey, listen, right. I said, this has kind of been a secret bucket list of mine for a long time. And I think that I could do it and I want to do it. And so I said, that's going to involve me hiring a coach and all these things. And so anyway, right. um, I ended up hiring a coach. It wasn't very far out. It was probably eight or nine weeks out from a show. I ended up hiring a coach and, uh, basically I stepped on stage and it, it was amazing. I loved it. It was so much fun. I knew I was hooked. And so I kept going with it. Uh, in the process of that, my very first coach, she encouraged me to get my personal training license. She's like, Connie, I mean, I'd be at her studio helping with practices when she was out of town for posing and all these things. And she was like, Connie, you have a really innate way of working with people. You need to chase that. She's like, you need to be. And then she's also said, well, you're, you're training it. You have such a emphasis on form and all these things. I really think that you would be better served as a personal trainer than the career you're in now. And I was kind of like, mm, I don't know about that. Ha ha ha. You know? So, uh, nutrition is really where my nerding out goes. I love nutrition. And so I started pursuing that first and I said, okay, well, everybody's asking me about all these training modalities and all this stuff. So I might as well know. And so I decided to go ahead and just get my personal training license just so that I had the knowledge. Well, then right. I started training people and I was like, I really love seeing people get results. I love people uh, learning how to help themselves. I love seeing all these aches and pains go away that they all of a sudden have fixed this imbalance that they had in their body. And now right. they're strong and now their back doesn't hurt or now their hip doesn't hurt or their knee doesn't hurt because they're actually working out. Or when I get an email, somebody says, oh, I did my first squat ever the other day and it didn't hurt. Like all of these things were like big motivators for me. And I, I love seeing people get success. So then I, you know, I end up getting my nutrition license and now I have it all into one nice little bundle and mm -hmm. it just, it works really well. <laughs> yep. Yep, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I I can totally understand. Um, me personally, I got involved in it because I, I changed my own life. As when we spoke before, I was telling you how, um, you know, I was morbidly obese. I almost died from a diabetic coma, all these different things. And I did the same thing as you. I, I just 
started learning stuff and and the more i learned the more i wanted to learn and then after i achieved success myself then it was you know bodybuilding started to become a goal because you know at some point in time i may be 60 years old when i do it but at some point in time i'm going to step on stage um but throughout the whole process it just kind of ingrained this passion in me to help other people and and i was helping other people long before i had any kind of certification or anything because people would hear my story and they'd be like how did you do that how how were you able to without a coach or anything like that just figure this stuff out and you know improve the quality of your life so as i was talking to him and the more i talked to him the more i was like man i really like doing this so and i was just like you i got my nutrition certification first because i don't know about you but i think you know training is training and people need to have good form and things like that and they need to have guidance but nutrition is the key nutrition is so powerful in what it does inside the body you know we just listened to your story briefly and and you touched on you know how certain types of nutrition can reduce inflammation and we all know now that inflammation in the body is is to blame for so much dis-ease within the body that once you take that inflammation away, so many things start to improve. So I think it's really powerful how you how you have that mindset as well as I do. I think that's great. I love that. And the thing about it is, is when you start to feel great, you want to, sh and you fa think you found the key to, to success, you want to share that with other people because you see so many other people struggling around you that could easily change their habits and their life and feel so much better and have so many oh, yeah. improvements over just making minor changes. I mean, my minor changes was a couple sets of squats and changing my nutrition. It it wasn't anything spectacular and did i take it to a bigger place absolutely i did and we can talk about this further but i took it to a little bit too far of a place as well which mm -hmm. people need to find a balance there you can you can overdo it as well and you know the typical standard american will do very well with minor activity changes and big nutrition changes. You don't have yeah. to go tap out an hour workout and be sore for weeks on end in order to see results. Yep, exactly. It's like, make sure your nutrition is on point and then move. That's it. Just move. Absolutely. Get up and do something. We live in a society today where everybody sits around and they've got these things and they're constantly doing this. And, you know, um, that's that's like our whole lives are wrapped up in these screens and we don't do the things that we used to do 15 20 years ago you know i i compare a, a lot of the lifestyle of children first and foremost when you look at kids today and the amount of activity they get versus what they did 20 or 30 years ago it is like night and day and then when you sit back and you look at the at the ever rising rates of childhood obesity childhood diabetes and all these other things you know you would think that that would set off a bell in people's heads to say hey i need to get my kid outside i need to get him playing i you know i need to get my kid involved in some sort of activity where he's not sitting around on his butt you know all these things all come together but people just don't draw the correlation and that's where people like yourself like me and and other coaches really are powerful and come into play because we can give you that that information that you might it might be right in front of your face but you're overlooking most definitely and you know the scary thing is is that only 12 percent of america is metabolically healthy only 12 percent. that includes children Yep. So that means we have children that and uh, many, many people that are going with undiagnosed insulin resistance and all sorts of things because their their diet is terrible. And especially what we're feeding kids now. I mean, think about it. We start them off with rice cereal and pureed fruits and all these things mm -hmm. from the very get go. We are challenging their insulin response. And eventually when they get older, their body gets gets tired of listening to that and they start struggling with things like uh you know obviously insulin resistance um obesity all these other diseases that come along with inflammation and it's starting from a young age and like you said with the phone 
so many children have phones now and that's all they do they get that dopamine hit every time they pick it up or same thing with the xbox and how many athletes do we have out there that don't ever become an athlete because they're so busy looking at their phone or playing their xbox they never get yep. to discover their potential because they're sitting there doing something mm -hmm with their hands and it's just really really sad there are so many people out there writers how many writers don't ever become a writer because they're busy on their phone it's just it's a sad thing and there there's so many things that we as a population are missing out on because we spend it in front of a screen yeah exactly you know i can remember well i i, I actually had a conversation with somebody here not too long ago when we were talking about how health and fitness has changed over the last 30 or 40 years on, on a huge level. And, you know, we were talking about how we know a whole lot more about, you know, about the body than we did years ago. But if you go back and you look like I was talking to a friend of mine and I was like, go back and look at all the pictures that you could find from Woodstock and tell me how many obese people you see. You don't. You don't see them. And they were they were walking around drinking beer and smoking weed and eating mushrooms and doing all this crap that that we all say now is not healthy. But look at them and look at us now. So you have to mm -hmm. kind of draw a correlation here at some point and say, what was different then compared to now? And it's because we we as a society were much more active. We were much more physical in our day-to-day -day lives than what we are today. And that's where we're falling short. Absolutely. And, you know, the really sad thing about it is, is also fitness has been portrayed to be something that it, it isn't really. I mean, if you go on social media or anything like that, you have people, all these fitness influencers saying how you should look and what you should do and what you should eat. And it's being completely blown out of proportion. Um, I think that there is a balance that needs to happen and that you don't have to go hard all day in order to achieve your goals. And I think that's a, a big misnomer in the fitness community is people go hard, go hard, go hard. Well, you know what happens when you have that gas pedal stuck down for a really long period of time. Next thing you know, you're going to wipe out. So yep. th the thing about the fitness community is it's not setting people up for sustainability either it's uh pushing people past their limits so they get burnout and tired and then they eventually they just fizzle out and crash and that's not something that i am a fan of at all either so there is a happy balance i know myself i i crashed pretty hard and it wasn't for lack of um overdoing it in a sense it's kind of hard to explain but i i pushed it way too hard for too long Mm -hmm. um, I suffered from some poor coaching and basically I was on too little of calories for too long because obviously more is better, right? So too little of calories for too long and next thing in, and too much exercise and eventually my body got mad and it was like, I'm sorry, we're done. And I didn't lose weight anymore. I didn't look good anymore. My autoimmune disease got out of control and next thing you know, I was crashing and no matter how much I worked out or how much I dieted or how much cardio I did, I looked horrible. So there is a happy balance that can happen there and you can overdo it as well. So that's something that I think society thinks is more is better and it's really not. So when I actually dialed things back, moved my lifting to three days a week, cut the cardio, brought my calories up, I did way, way better. So that's another thing to keep in mind i see women out there constantly starving themselves i see it in the mm -hmm. fitness forums all over the place i actually ended up getting off of social media because i couldn't look at it anymore as far as the fitness groups and things like that go right people are like oh you just need to be in a deficit in order to lose weight or your hormones don't matter all these things which is absolutely incorrect right and i couldn't stomach looking at other women giving women advice to starve like Mm -hmm. that, that's going to get you nowhere in the end. Yeah, for sure. It's like there is a, I, I'm a resident coach in a huge Facebook group called the dad bod transformation group. And we had a member in there and I won't mention him by name, but this guy, he's, he's pretty jacked. You can, you can tell by, you know, and well, you don't really have to tell by looking at him or anything. You can, he, he, he is very open about the fact that he uses steroids and things like that. But he would come in and you would have these guys coming in 
that were in their 30s, 40s, sometimes in their 50s. And he's like, you know, I've tried so and they're like, I've tried so many different things, but I can't just lose weight. And he'd be like, well, your problem is you need to eat a 1000 calories or less a day and all this crap. And I'm like, dude, you, you've got to be kidding me. I was like, no. you know, first of all, where where is your fa where's your basis and foundation of science for this? Please tell me that. Well, that's what I did. Okay, well, you might have done that. But that's Number one, it's anecdotal information at best. Number two, you're obviously on gear. Um, you know, you you say mm -hmm. it all the time. So people don't understand that when you're taking steroids um, or any type of anabolic, your body will react differently to the stimulus that it's given, both through nutrition and through and through weight training. You know, but it's like, do you not understand what? adaptive thermogenesis is in the body and what happens if you're in a caloric deficit for too long your body will adapt to that and your metabolism adapts to it and then you get into a situation like you were in connie where you just couldn't lose weight anymore and all these other things people are wrecking their metabolism by doing these extreme calorie deficits because they think that more is better well if i'm losing a little bit of weight with a 500 calorie deficit, what happens if I do a 900 or a thousand calorie deficit and they don't realize the damage that they're doing? Absolutely, and the down regulation of all their hormones and everything. I know I personally oh, yeah. completely killed off my thyroid by extreme dieting and large amounts of cardio for too long. And now I'm permanently taking thyroid hormones in order to keep my body balanced. And it's mm -hmm. just kind of a bad situation. Uh, I have it all under control now, but looking back on it, I knew it was wrong was the thing is I had the education and I had the knowledge. However, at the time I was so focused on my goals and what my coach said I could do and all of these things that I, I just kept pushing anyways, because my coach kept assuring me, Oh no, it'll be okay. I've done this right. before. I should have listened to that inner voice that said, Hey, no, you know better than to do this. You need to get your calories back up and, and jump ship here. And what was happening was my body was already going, nope, I'm done. It had its white flag up, SOS. And I just said, sorry, I'm going to still keep going. And I drove it into the ground with crazy caloric deficits and large amounts of cardio in order to step on stage. And that's another thing is I thought that being shredded and looking amazing all the time would make me happy but instead at single digit body fat and size one shorts i would still look at myself and be like oh my gosh look at that cellulite or oh my gosh look at this mm -hmm. and that's the other thing about fitness is it's not reality a lot of these bodies people are putting online is it's not reality and right. so you have this girls think oh if i just work out i can look like that girl in that magazine or i can look like this or that and it's not true you know right. there are some things that we have that we are stuck with for me like i have cellulite other women have cellulite i'm fit i'm lean i look great right now guess what i still have cellulite no amount of exercise is going to get rid of that when i'm down in the low digits for body fat i still have it and that, that's just who i am and that's a re that's a reality that we all have to face and i think that all the filters and all these I mean, how many pictures do these women take of themselves before they select one that shows the absolute perfect body? It's yes. just not reality. And so we're trying to become this woman or this person that we see that is not real. You're well, and so the thing was, is I thought that I could be that perfect woman and I thought that I could look that way. And I, even when I did look that way, I wasn't happy. So no number on the scale nothing's going to make you happy unless you can be happy with yourself period and right. i think that that's a big problem with the fitness industry as well is everything is judged by a number on the scale it's not judged by the changes in your body or the how much strength you gain or yeah. or like squatting without knee pain or not having back pain at work like it's not based off of that it's all based off of oops the number on the scale hasn't changed so guess what you yeah, failed. You've got to do something else. Right. You know, and, and, and to your point about the, the, you know, the, the women that you see, and even the men for that matter, when you see these fitness magazines and all that, what people don't realize is like, for example, if a, if a female athlete is going in to do a photo shoot for a magazine, she typically diets three to six months 
to get ready for that photo shoot. She busts her ass. She gets down to the least amount of body fat possible so she can look absolutely fantastic for this photo shoot. But anytime you're doing this, and you can attest to this as being in bodybuilding, how many bodybuilders do you know that are shredded year round? They're not. You can't sustain that. You cannot sustain no, it because the links can't. that... Yeah, the lengths that you have to go to to achieve it are too drastic. Your body can't sustain it long term. No, and you start getting all this feedback from your body that's saying SOS, no, we're done. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. But a lot of these people posting these pictures are, are pictures they've taken throughout the year and right. they're posting them. You know, and I mean, even like to to just embed the point here, like Tom Brady, for example, if he does a photo shoot for some whatever advertisement it is or whatever promotion he is doing, he doesn't do it during the actual playing season. He does it in the right. off season so he can diet down and look mm -hmm. the part for that role. So right. because otherwise it would affect his performance Absolutely. in the football on the field so mm -hmm. so they don't do it in the on season they do it in the off season and these women like for beach body and things like that they're doing extreme dieting at one point i was listening to this podcast this woman was a beach body uh person for ages and ages and i was listening to it and she said she showed up she was working out like three times a day she was extremely lean extremely vascular she shows up to the shoot to film a new beach body video and they said Eh, you got to lose five pounds. We don't like the way that you look today. And wow. she said she was so sick. Yeah, she said she was so sick from training so much and eating like 500 calories a day. So what did she do? She said, yes, I'll lose the five pounds. And she went and lost the five pounds and filmed the video. And this is the stuff we're putting in front of other women and telling them, oh, do our video. You are going to look like this. You're putting this fake persona out there. And all of these women believe that if they work that hard and they do these videos and they drink these shakes, they can look like that. And it's not reality. Nope. Nope. It's nothing but a marketing gimmick is all it is. You know, one of the things that at least I've been told um, about my own coaching style and who I am as an individual is that. I don't fit the mold of a traditional trainer and a nutritionist. I'm 53 years old. I have a little excess body fat, but you know what? I am a hell of a, I'm a hell of a sight better off than what I was 13 years ago when I almost died. And my journey is my proof. If that makes sense. I, you know, I can sit here and talk the talk because not only do I have the education to back it up, but I've also walked the walk. You know, I'm actually, I Absolutely. just released a pro I just released a program at the beginning of August and I've got a bunch of guys in there doing this program to maintain muscle and lose body fat. And I'm actually doing it with them because I have weight to lose. And you know, it's, it's, you don't see a whole lot of that. You, you'll see a lot of coaches that are just like, this is the workout. This is the meal plan. You know, this is what works for everybody else. So you need to do this. And I'm like, no, I got weight to lose just like you guys. So guess what? You're going to hold me accountable. I'm going to hold you accountable. We're going to have group coaching calls and do all these other things. Because at the end of the day, you know, first and foremost, you have to make time for it. You have to make time for yourself. You have to make time for fitness. But you have to find ways to make yourself accountable. Because if you don't, you're not going to stick with it. At least that's how I look at it. Absolutely. And the thing is, is like even myself with my clients, I may be doing different things. I mean, predominantly right now I have bodybuilding clients, which is kind of weird because look, when I'm teaching them to pose and we're all together in my studio, posing, things like that, I feel so much heftier than them <laughs> I, it's kind of funny and they're right. like no they're like no are you kidding my, my one gal she's always like i want to have shoulders like you and i'm like you do <laughs> like yeah. we all see each other so differently and yeah. it's it's i feel because i'm doing i'm doing a different training modality right now i have different goals right now i look very different from what i feel like i should have looked and what i lived eat breathe sleep for so long now I've completely switched gears, but I still show my clients that I am doing all it takes to achieve my goals and that right. I'm there doing it every day too, even if it's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so many people get wrapped up in, you know, you talk about Beachbody and, and some of these other things. 
Um, so much of the fitness industry, the diet industry and whatnot, it's all just, it's so cookie cutter. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, this, don't get me wrong. Like I'll, I'll throw an example out there. What was it? Uh, it the insanity program. Yeah. They call that shit insanity for a reason because you might be able to do it. <laughs> you might be able to do it and survive and you may lose weight. But can you sustain that? Is that a lifestyle that you can sustain for the rest of your life? No, you're not going to be able to do it. So it's like putting a Band-Aid on cancer. I use that saying all the time. It doesn't do any good in the long term. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other unfortunate part about it is, is all these programs are largely cardio based. They're not actually really strength training of any form. And right. people metabolism functions much better with lean body mass doing all this cardio exercise and stuff like that is actually not really that healthy uh you're, you would be, benefit so much more from strength training with progressive overload strength training and progressing and and lifting things especially for women osteoporosis all these things is it's very very important it's important for men too but for women we are prone when we start to go through perimenopause and menopause we are prone to getting osteoporosis and all of these other conditions and by maintaining lean body mass we are actually going to help ourselves through all of these hormonal changes all of this stuff that comes with aging so much more smoothly so yeah. it's very very important that women strength train i actually had a patient in the other day uh, for my day job and she was like my i have really i've been diagnosed with really bad osteoporosis but my doctor instead of putting me on a medication told me that he wanted me to start lifting weights so i have started lifting weights because the thing is, is our bones grow in response to strain so if yep. you're lifting weights your bones are going to get stronger without taking all of these bisphosphonates and all of these things that are going to affect you in other ways so you may be taking a bisphosphonate and you may be helping your osteoporosis. However, you are opening yourself up to all sorts of other things like osteonecrosis, which is yeah. the dying of your bones, which is a big thing with people taking bisphosphonates and also all sorts of other things. So uh, it, it's really scary what they're putting people on when it can just all be solved with some activity every day. It can, you know, it, it is so crazy. Um, but I like what you said about, you know, adding the lean muscle tissue and how the bones build up and everything. That was the turning point for me. Now, um, about, I'm going to say it had been about six years and I had lost about 100 pounds since, since my aha moment. And um, I read an article one day and they were talking about how the more lean muscle tissue you have, the better your metabolism functions, the better your body is at being able to handle the nutrients that you're putting in it. And that was like hitting me upside the head with a brick. That's what got me involved in weightlifting. I literally, like the next day I went and joined a gym and I hadn't been in the gym in 30 years. I went and joined a gym, I started lifting weights and I started seeing results. And as I started seeing more muscle tissue being added and more fat taken away, I watched my blood glucose readings drop off to nothing. And then the next thing you know, I wasn't on any mm -hmm. diabetic medicine at all. And I had my my endocrinologist was like, you are in your 40s and you're doing this. And and it's amazing. And they were having me speak to groups of new clients that would come in that had been recently diagnosed with type two diabetes about how I had, you know, progressed on my journey. So when you sit back and you look at all that stuff like I do all the time, it's just truly amazing what people can do, what people can heal themselves of if they just put forth a little effort and move. But, you know, uh, so many people. Absolutely. Yeah. So many people use the excuse. I don't have time. I'm too busy. What is what are some of the things that you work with with your clients when it comes to them trying to find time for fitness? Um, yeah, so that's always a difficult one and it's always individualized. I mean, everybody has their different 
excuses and things like that. Um, I know one big thing that's helped me get people active is um, having people with a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or whatever, just get in 12,000 steps a day. That's like the the main minimum that I'm I'm like, I don't care what you got to do. If you got to walk around the building after every phone call at work or what you got to do, but get in those steps. So we get in those steps. And then in my programs, I'm going to be divulging here a secret, <laughs> but that's okay. Hopefully somebody can put it to use. In all of my programs, I have the compound movement at the beginning of the workout, and it is my rule that you cannot skip the gym. You have to at least go in and do that compound movement, which is right. going to take you 15 minutes tops. I mean, that's like mm -hmm. between going, walking in the gym, scanning your key card, dropping your gym bag in the locking locker room, going and doing that compound movement. That's going to be 15 minutes tops. So that's part of the rule with my programming. You have to, you can skip your workout if you have to, if you don't have time, but you need to at least go in and do that compound movement that I have scheduled for that day. It's highlighted in red. And what I find is most everybody goes in, does that compound movement, and then they're already there. So they end up doing the rest of their workout as well. So oh, yeah. that's one of the one of the things that I tools that I've been using in my toolkit. It works really great. Uh, the other thing is is just working with people's schedules. When can you fit this in? And like I said, it's highly individualized. But even it really depends on the person. If that person is totally crunch for time, then I will just set up a small full body workout or something like that three days a week for a half an hour. That's yeah. all you need. You don't need to go in and spend all this time. So, I mean, if that's all you can set aside, set aside that half hour, put it in your schedule. If you're a busy person and you have a tendency to go do other things, just schedule it in your schedule like it's a doctor's appointment and hold yourself accountable to it. It's very important that you make that time. Otherwise, you're going to be making time for other things like real doctor's visits when you have other problems going on. Right. You know, that is so powerful. Let me go back and touch on that for just a second. The fact that you set the compound movement at the beginning is brilliant. Okay. Um, a lot of trainers have a tendency to do the more isolation movements first, a lot of times for the purposes of warming up the joint, things of that nature. But the doing the compound movement, because you're exactly right, if you can get them in there and do nothing else but that, at least they're doing something, at least they're getting something. And the compound movements, for those that don't know, are set up to to work more than one muscle group, one joint at a time. It's a multi-joint exercise. So that is brilliant. But the other thing that I want to touch on is the fact that you individualize your programs. I think that that is so powerful and it's something that most coaches don't do. I know I myself, this the last program that I just launched, um, I have guys in it that are, there's such a wide base of guys that I have in this program. I have one guy who is used to working out six days a week and he loves that. That is his release, that's what he wants to do. I structured the program when I first built it all as a five day split. But because he enjoys working out six days a week, I tailored his workout to where he could get the same amount of volume in the six days a week. I have one guy that likes to, to run him and his girlfriend like to run and they run two days a week. So I modified his workout to where it wouldn't interfere with their running. I made sure that the days that they were going to be running, it would be a couple days after he did legs or something like that. So there was no interference. And then I have one guy that has has no gallbladder he has celiac disease and he's a type 1 diabetic and he's never exercised in his life so i took and totally restructured the workout to something that's tailored to him and what i would say to anybody that's listening to this is that if you're working with a coach and they say okay here's the workout this is what all my clients are doing or if they hand you a nutrition program and they say the same thing take your money and run because they're not going to do you any good in the long term Absolutely. And you also want to make sure that if you have someone that's doing your nutrition and your training both, that they are make it's not in a, some huge deficit in order to get results. There are coaches out there posting before and after pictures of their clients and they're saying, look at the changes I've made in eight weeks. Well, of course you can make these changes in eight weeks if you're starving your clients and you're overtraining them. But what's going to happen is when that eight weeks is through, potentially longer than that, but that client's going to go binge, they're hungry, 
all of their progress is going to kind of go flush because they were put on this extreme program. Slow and steady wins the race when it comes to Absolutely. fitness and weight loss and health. And you want to do something that's sustainable. And I even have to remind myself that I'm not perfect. I get in a hurry for things. I like for right now I'm training for a 120 mile bicycle race. Um, it's a complete different shift in what I've been doing in my life. <laughs> I've been oh, doing sure. everything that goes off of how I look and I can't do that for this bicycle race. <laughs> I can't do it for endurance training. I have to have a different look and I have to eat a lot more and things are totally different. And it has been one of the best things I have ever done for myself changing gears and having to train in a different modality, having to look at myself in a different light, letting some of the muscle go, because guess what? If you are training for an endurance, your body is going to make itself lighter. That means yes. it's going to be tossing out some of your muscle mass and yep. having to be okay with that in order to reach my goals. And to tell you the truth at this point, I am more mentally healthy with the physique I have now than I ever was when I was shredded and, and ripped. It just, I'm doing much better putting my goals into endurance and strength and outcomes rather than how I look. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like it, it, you saying that reminds me of one of the guys when I was early on in my fitness journey, one of the guys that I really followed a lot of his stuff um, was on bodybuilding.com was Chris Gethin. And I thought I when he went through that that spell where he was training to do Ironman competitions rather than, you know, training as a bodybuilder and how everybody told him that there was no way he'd be able to do an Ironman, you know, with the muscle mass that he had and all that stuff. And he actually realized he went into it with the thought process of the hell I can't. But he found that he actually did exactly what you just said. His body shifted to accommodate the workload that he was putting on it. And it was amazing to watch that transformation and then to make, to watch him transform back. You know, I, I guess that's kind of an attest, a testament to the power of the adaptability of the body, but you've got to do things smartly. You can't, you can't just be like, yep, I'm, I'm going to train seven days a week, twice a day, and I'm going to cut out all but about a thousand calories and I'm going to be a shredded. Yeah. You're going to be a shredded something. All right. You're going to be a shredded Q-tip bean pole or something, but you're not going to be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And it's been crazy to see the shift in my body as well, because I'm treating it right, right? I'm no longer in a huge caloric deficit. I'm no longer counting my calories. I don't log every single thing that goes in my mouth. I'm just paying very close attention to the kind of nutrition that I'm putting in to fuel my performance. I'm judging things based on PRs, times, how I feel, what my recovery is like, all sorts mm -hmm. of things. And it is crazy the shift that my body has made and i've had so many people actually tell me they like the way i look now way way better and at first i thought i was going to go into this stay buff because let's be honest when you do something for so long and you identify under something like i was identifying myself as a bodybuilder and i claim to be coaching people and all these things and then they right. they're like you're a bodybuilder look at you now you know you look what's going on here <laughs> but <laughs> the thing is is you have to stop placing an identity on yourself and start giving yourself credit for the amazing things that you're doing like when i started cycling i had just gotten done with major hip surgery it was the only thing that i could do that would work with my hip surgery so right. i started doing it because i wanted to do a little bit of cardio lose some weight mm -hmm. And uh, kind of start getting my, I had given my body a lot of grace for about a year. And I, and I was like, you know, the healing process has, has been underway for a while now. We're going to start jumping back into things. So I started cycling. Well, little did I know that I was going to get addicted to it. And <laughs> I really, really enjoyed doing it. And I thought, you know, it's time to, to come up with a new goal. It's time to do something else. And so I started having a one long ride a week, which my long ride used to be 17 miles. Now my long rides like 80 miles. And yeah. it's crazy to see the progressions that have happened. I started out, I remember the first day I jumped on my bike because I've biked before. I like to bike. The first day I jumped on my bike, I thought I was going to go five or six miles like I normally would. 
and I went like a mile and I was dying. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I can't make uh -huh. it any further. And I just kept right. doing that every single day. I had a five mile loop I would do. And then I went to 10 miles. And now my daily workout is 30 miles or more. So basically to see myself progress has been a really amazing thing. And I feel healthier than ever. I'm fueling my body properly. I'm eating nutritious foods. I'm still lifting. I did not quit lifting. Lifting is important for health and lean body oh, mass. Absolutely. I still do it. But my goals have changed and I've learned not to identify by the way I look but more identify myself based on how I feel and what my performance is. Yep. Absolutely. You know, that's the main thing. It's like we, you touched on it earlier and, and I tell people all the time and it's kind of funny the way I tell them, but you know, I, I do it because I have found that people have a tendency to relax and absorb more if you can get them laughing. And a lot of times when I'm working with clients, they'll be like, okay, well, how many times should I weigh myself in a month and all this other stuff? I'm like, look, here's what I want you to do. If you don't already have one, get yourself a good scale, one that you know is relatively accurate. And they're like, yeah, okay, then what? And I'm like, throw that son bitch in the closet and dig it out about once a month and weigh yourself if you want. Because if you chase those numbers on a scale, like you were touching on earlier, you're gonna drive yourself batshit crazy. You need to focus on how you feel how you look, how your clothes fit you, those are gonna be the true measuring points that are gonna show you just how successful your efforts are being. But if you're chasing those numbers, you know, I, I've said this countless times, I can remember a time where I went to bed at 239 pounds, woke up at 242, and there's no cracker crumbs in the bed, so I don't know how the hell I gained three pounds overnight. So when you, when you look at that, and then you look at the people that chase those numbers on a scale on a regular basis, you can see how they just drive themselves nuts. Absolutely. And, you know, it, the scale is not a dictator of anything. And I know um, I've taken pictures of my clients and, and compared them and said, hey, look, at you're heavier here, but you look better. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with myself. And I have learned I had to give myself grace with that, right? Because after my hip surgery, when I got done with all of that, I was 152 pounds. And I was like, oh my gosh, my stage weight is 114 pounds. Like this is, <laughs> this is insane. And it was right. stressing me out. And no matter how much I would cut my calories and no matter what nutrition modality I tried or how much I worked out, I was not losing any weight and it was extremely frustrating. And basically when I stopped counting calories, stopped weighing myself, started eating real food, which I have always done, but I switched things a little bit. Um, I eat, I'm mostly ketogenic now. Uh, I switched things a little bit. And then I started not hammering my body with constant weight training all the time because I, I was training so hard all the time. I think my body needed a break. I started watching my heart rate variability. When my body wasn't happy, I wasn't training. I wasn't like, oh no, I'm gonna shrink overnight because I didn't train. I started watching my heart rate variability, all my other vital signs and training based on how my recovery was and how my body felt. That's when the scale started to fluctuate a little bit, but it didn't fluctuate that much. I've lost 10 pounds over the last six months, but my body looks completely different and I'm wearing completely different clothing than I was. So really the scale is not an indication of anything. Yep, you are you are totally right. Okay, we are about out of time and there is still so much that I wanted to talk to you about. This is crazy. And I knew this was gonna happen. Hell, when we first talked, typically I only talk to people for like five or 10 minutes and I think we talked for like a half an hour and you had just got done a biking session and you were, you were like, oh, you were drenched and all this Red. other stuff. So here's what we're, here's what we're going to need to do. We're going to wrap this one up for this time, but do me a favor. After you do your bike race, will you come back on the show? Absolutely. I'd love to. Awesome. Awesome. Because I want to talk to you about metabolic flexibility and, and some of these other things that we didn't even get time to talk to about, talk about this time. So I definitely want to have you back on. So Connie, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Um, you are an inspiration to anybody that, that will take the time to learn about you and learn about your story. Um, and to see the way that you have transitioned throughout your life from one modality of fitness to another is just absolutely phenomenal. And I, I, I got to thank you so much for being on the show. 
Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Good. Awesome. All right. Sit tight one second. I'm going to flip over and wrap this up and then I'll be right back with you. Wow. We ran out of time. I have, I very rarely do I ever run out of time with a guest on this show. I usually get to everything that I want to get to, but, but Connie just has so many inspiring stories and, and just her, her mindset about things is truly fascinating to me. And I know you guys got value out of this. So do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, share this video with a friend that could use some inspiration. And after you subscribe to the channel, make sure you hit that bell and the all thing. Otherwise you won't get told anytime I'm dropping new podcast episodes until I see you guys again, you know, my motto playtime's over. It's time to go to work.